G'day everyone and welcome to topic 3 for Laws 11062 Contracts B. My name is Anthony Maranac and this week we're going to have a look at Estoppel. Estoppel is a law French word um, which comes from the French word meaning to plug or to stop and uh, essentially that's what an estoppel does it stops um, our opponent or in the case of a contract or a near contract the other party from doing or saying things which they'd led us to believe they wouldn't do so let's uh, jump right into estoppel and see how it works what I will say before we begin is that this is a topic which is really odd for law students because it seems to take people a little while to get it and understand it but then as soon as they do as soon as law students feel like they understand estoppel they want to jump in and find estoppels everywhere and we start finding that in answers to problem questions we have students try to argue estoppels that really and truly they are just not there <clears throat> so it's very important as we go through the material for estoppel that you learn not only um, what an estoppel is but also what an estoppel isn't let's begin shall we what we're going to do in order to learn what estoppel is and how it works in Australia is uh, we will go through a series of cases we'll start right back with Pinnell's case uh, many centuries ago and we'll come right through to the key Australian case called Waltons and Ma. We'll also look at the fact that estoppel arises from equity rather than from common law or from statute and then we'll look at the five elements of estoppel which were established in Waltons and Ma and talk about how they work. So what is this concept of estoppel? Well there's a range of types of estoppel and all of them have the same effect in that they prevent a litigant they stop a litigant from doing something which they might otherwise have wanted to do in pursuit of a case now in the lecture notes I've indicated three types of estoppel the first is estoppel by record now estoppel by record says that once a matter is litigated once a matter is completed you can't go back and have another go okay you are stopped from doing so otherwise you could theoretically sue somebody for exactly the same thing over and over and over again and uh, hope that eventually the court changed its mind and saw things your way that doesn't happen the second type of estoppel we call common law estoppel and this is a rule of evidence it says that it essentially says that you can't take your opponent by surprise so you can't uh, in all of your affidavit material and your um, submissions before a case comes to court you can't lead your opponents to believe that you're going to rely on one version of events and then all of a sudden when you get into the courtroom rely on something completely different um, that's really not the way that our uh, that our um, civil law courts work and indeed the criminal law courts where the prosecution has an even greater duty of full disclosure good news we're not going to worry about estoppel by record or common law estoppel for the purposes of this uh, course because they don't really have anything to do with contract law what we're going to be looking at is the third type of estoppel which is called equitable or promissory estoppel now equitable or promissory estoppel enforces gratuitous promises now what's a gratuitous promise well we all remember from contracts a what the term is for a gratuitous promise a gratuitous promise is nudum pactum because it's a promise for which no consideration has been received in reply now normally our understanding of the formation of contracts would say if somebody hasn't received consideration in return for a promise then the promise is not enforceable against them and most of the time that is true however there are some circumstances where the law of equity says it would be unconscionable it would be unjust it would be unfair to allow a party to get away with moving away from a promise or representation they've made because the other party has relied on it there are some circumstances in which the court will come to the rescue 
Now what we're going to do in the material today is work our way through the series of cases in which this concept was developed until we get to the point at the end of the day of being able to say here are the specific rules which set out the circumstances in which the court will come to the rescue and will enforce the promissory estoppel, will enforce a gratuitous promise that's made by one party to another. So our jumping off point is Pinnell's case. Now um, those of you uh, who remember your notes from consideration last year or last term will remember Pinnell's case well. The rule in Pinnell's case is that payment of a smaller sum cannot be good consideration for the discharge of a debt. So if you owe me a thousand dollars and I say to you all right well look let's make a new contract. The new contract is that you pay me eight hundred dollars and I forgive you for the entire thousand dollar debt. So I discharge the thousand dollar debt in return for the payment of eight hundred dollars. Now Pinnell's case says that's not on. Pinnell's case says that the payment of the eight hundred dollars cannot be good consideration for forgiveness of the thousand dollar debt. You have to pay the full amount in order to discharge the rule in Pinnell's case. Now when I described the rule in Pinnell's case to, uh, to most groups of students the immediate reaction from most students is well hang on that doesn't sound real fair. I mean after all if you want to forgive someone their debt why shouldn't you be allowed to? If you want to forgive someone if you want to say look just give me 800 bucks and we'll call it even Stevens why shouldn't you be allowed to? Well the answer of course is that you shouldn't be allowed to because you're not receiving adequate compensation you're not receiving adequate consideration but then that argument doesn't wash either does it because you are receiving consideration in this case you'd be receiving 800 bucks worth of consideration so it's not like you're letting them off scot-free so what do we do about this? What do we do about this situation? Well, for 250 years they did nothing. Pinnell's case was heard in 1602. Okay, so Pinnell's case was heard over 400 years ago. And Pinnell's case remains an authority today. But on this particular question, Pinnell's case remained an authority until 1877 when the court decided the case of Hughes and the Metropolitan Railway. As I say this is an 1877 case and it's recorded in the second volume of appeal cases for that year at page 439. We're talking about a property deal. Okay, There was a, a, a property owner who gave a 99 year lease so essentially a perpetual lease to a tenant. And one of the conditions of that lease was that uh, where there were works that needed to be carried out, they had to be carried out on this occasion by the tenant. And so the demand could be made by the owner for the works to be carried out and the uh, tenants would have to do so. Now on this occasion a demand was made and repairs needed to be done within a certain specified period of time of six months. So demand was made on the 22nd of October the repairs had to be completed by the 22nd of April the following year. Now in this case though the tenants got them the demand and they said okay it's going to cost us a certain amount of money to try and fix the joint up. They said what we'd actually rather do is buy the place outright. Would you be prepared to sell the place outright to us? And that's the way that we'll respond to this. And so the two parties started negotiating around a sale. Now of course the tenants in the meanwhile didn't do anything about the repairs because if they had ended up purchasing the house then they wouldn't have needed to repair it because it would have been theirs. So the demand from the previous uh, owner would no longer have had any effect. So that was pretty reasonable for them not to want to sink costs into repairs that they might not consider were necessary anyway problem is the negotiations for the sale broke down in December and that meant there wasn't enough time between uh, between December and the uh, the due date in April for the repairs to be carried out 
So April the 22nd came along and the owners said, no, you haven't done the job. I'm going to sue. Essentially, he wanted to sue to have the tenants thrown out. Now, what do you reckon here? You see, this is kind of similar to the rule in Pennell's case because the rule in Pennell's case occurred when someone had said, look, I will forgive you. I will forgive you the full debt if you pay me part of it. But then they'd changed their mind. So they'd led them to believe one situation would be all right, but then they suddenly changed their mind. Well, that's pretty much what happened in Hughes, isn't it? Because Hughes led them to believe that they were going to be able to buy the, the property and that they therefore wouldn't need to meet the timing requirements which they would be obligated to meet as a tenant. But then the negotiations stopped. And when the negotiations stopped, they were going to run out of time. And they weren't going to run out of time because they had been lax or because they had been improper. They were going to run out of time because they had been negotiating in good faith on the sale. So what the courts said is to the seller, you've lulled the other party. You've lulled the other party into believing that because there's going to be this sale, you're not going to enforce the need to make the uh, the need to make the repairs. And so, we're not going to allow you to do that. We're not going to allow you to resile from the representation that you made, that said effectively, we're going to negotiate on the sale, and so as a result, there won't be any harm to you in terms of timing. So what the court decided in Hughes and the Metropolitan Railway is that the six months that they had in which to make the repairs, that six months would not run. It would not run during the period of time that the parties had been negotiating. Now you can see that that's almost the opposite. It's almost a dead set opposite of Pinnell's case. Pinnell's case says... Yes, you can lull someone into a false sense of security because if they owe you the money, they owe you the money. Hughes and Metropolitan says, no, you can't lull someone into a false sense of security. If you do that, equity is going to come to the rescue. Now, let's think about this idea of equity. How would the common law have decided Hughes and the Metropolitan Railway? Well, pretty simply, the common law would have said, we'll look at the content of the contract and we'll apply it. The content of the contract says April the 22nd, it wasn't done by April the 22nd, and therefore the owner deserves the remedy. Equity doesn't work like that. Equity said it would be unconscionable. Equity said yes, the owner has these rights, but it would be unconscionable for the owner to rely upon them. Because the owner had lulled the tenants into thinking that they may well not have to comply with the works order. So we can see that um, both the common law and equity address this situation and they come up with a different answer. And in this particular occasion, equity has prevailed. Now, I've asked you to think about this in, in the slides. I've asked you to think about this in terms of contract theory. You remember right back to the start of week one in contracts A, we talked about contract theory and we've run up against it a few times uh, since then. We talked in particular, my two favourites, the classical contract theory and promise theory. Now classical contract theory says two parties can make the law between themselves. They can make a private law between themselves and that private law will be enforceable by the courts. Well how do we see Hughes and Metropolitan? On the one hand we could say the private law between these parties was You've got six months to do your repairs. If you don't do them, then you get kicked out. But we could also say that that part of the private law was suspended, was suspended by mutual agreement, which they were free to do because they were undertaking these negotiations. What do you reckon promise theory would say? Well, promise theory, I think, would see it a little bit differently. Promise theory would say, initially, there was a promise by the owner to provide the premises and there were a series of promises by the renter to do things like pay rent but also 
to attend to any required works within six months of the demand. But then later on, there was essentially a promise by the owner that time would not run, that they would, that the the buyers would not suffer as a result of the delay in the repairs, which was caused by the negotiation. So promise theory would say we're going to uh, enforce that final promise as much as we're enforcing the earlier two. So you can see Hughes in Metropolitan Railway moves us quite a bit along, moves us quite a ways away from where Pinnell's case left everything off. And that brings us to our third case, which is Birmingham and the North Western Railway. Now, Birmingham, uh, it's more properly called Birmingham and District Land Company, and the London and North Western Railway Company. Now in this case, again, it's it's a uh, it's a discussion about land, and in this case, land development. Now, um, the developer, having uh, started the development, having made the contract to develop houses, suddenly found that there there was a railway proposal, and as a result, he said, "Well, look, we're not going to build any houses here because." If there's a proposal to build a railway through this area of land, it doesn't make any sense to build houses here and potentially then have them knocked down again. So, so the uh, the uh, party said to the the land contractors, "Stop building houses." But then, of course, a deal was done, and so the railway project wasn't going to impinge. The question became, what happens to the completion date? What happens to the completion date on those houses? Well, the court found a pretty simple and pretty sensible answer to that, which was that having directed the uh, other party to stop work, having directed the party not to continue building because there was a potential for this railway uh, project to intervene, it was no longer equitable for the party, Bolton was his name, uh, to rely on that initial date. Now nothing had changed in the contract here. Nothing had changed in the contract. This was equity coming to the rescue and saying we're going to um, we're going to look at these circumstances and we're going to say the strict terms of the contract should not apply. Now after this lecture I want you to go and have a read of Birmingham and Northwestern. I want you to have a careful look at it and say, was there bad faith going on here? See, I reckon there was. This fellow Bolton told them to stop work. And having told them to stop work, having prevented them from continuing to work, he's later on tried to rely upon that delay as causing a breach. That's pretty much, you remember uh, in contract A, we talked about the doctrines of uh, the, requ the implied requirement for cooperation and the implied requirement of good faith. Now, these things have been discovered much more recently than Birmingham and Northwestern Railway. But the modern requirement would be that you act with good faith. Do you reckon it's acting with good faith if you tell someone to stop work and then later on rely upon the fact that they've stopped work as uh, constituting a breach? Because I sure, sure don't think that that's reasonable. But anyway, the law of estoppel moved on um, after Birmingham and North Western Railway, so we don't need to resolve the uh, question of good faith. What we do need to understand is that Birmingham and North Western Railway confirmed that previous decision in Hughes. It confirmed that under some circumstances, equity will intervene. And equity will say to parties, if you've made representations to the other party, you can't then go and, and, uh, and turn your back on those representations. You can't go and say, well, look, I told you that, but I didn't really mean it, so now I'm going to go and sue you as though the position was something different. In Hughes, having said, we'll negotiate so the time won't be an issue, you then held to that promise. In Birmingham, having said stop building until we find out if there's a railway going through here, you held to that direction. The law continued to develop and, and, and probably took its most important term 
uh, turn in UK law in what we call the high trees case and uh, this was um, the Central London Property Trust and High Trees House. This was a 1947 case and it was reported in the King's Bench reports of that year uh, on page 130. Yet again, it's a case about rents. Now what happened was in 1937, so before the start of the Second World War, um, the block of flats was uh, rented out to um, a, a company which then intended to sublet the flats. So essentially High Trees House was a company and, and it was subletting the flats to individual uh, individual renters. And um, so they were then supposed to pay an amount to the trust out of those rents. Problem is after the outbreak of the Second World War and particularly after the uh, the very substantial and rapid su successes of the German army early in the war um, there began to be bombing raids over London around the time of the Battle of Britain and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people were evacuated from London nobody wanted to live in London because London was getting bombed what happened as a result is that the bottom dropped out of the rental market and it was simply not going to be possible simply not going to be possible for that period of time uh, for High Trees House to obtain sufficient rental incomes to pay the amount that they were supposed to pay uh, to the Central London Property Trust. And sensibly, the two parties sat down and negotiated and they made a deal. And the deal was essentially that for the duration of the war, the Central London Property Trust would accept only half of the amount. the end of the war all of a sudden it became much easier to obtain renters for these premises and so Central London Property Trust came back and said well now we want to start getting the rent money back again please. The dispute emerged because High Trees House they were perfectly happy to start paying the original amount again now that they were getting uh, the rental income in. What they weren't happy about was that the Central London Property Trust had also asked them to start paying back the money that they had not paid during the period of time when they were paying at half rate. Now the thing you have to understand is that that had never been part of the deal. It had never been part of the deal that the Property Trust was going to be able to recoup those half rate losses after the end of the war. So they ended up in court and what did the court say? Well the court said we're going to hold you to that second promise. The second promise was pay half rent during the war. We're going to hold you to that. You are not going to be able to move away from that promise and say now that the war's over we want all that money back. And so for the first time here we have the law of equity saying to the promisor your second amended promise even though it was given without consideration because it was just an amendment to the first contract we're going to hold you to that. We're going to hold you to a promise that has not been secured by consideration. Isn't that remarkable if we think about our elements of contract formation? Here we have, under essentially contract law, a promise that is not supported by consideration and yet it is going to be enforced as though it was a contractual obligation. That's what we take from High Tree's house. And then, after dealing with high trees, things take on a very Australian flavour. Because in Australia, as recently as 1988, the, uh, the law of estoppel took on what I, I believe is now going to be its definitive form. And uh, it's probably a more sensible form of law in Australia uh, than it is anywhere else in the world. Let's look at how estoppel works in Australia. The case is called Walton Stores Interstate and Ma. It's a 1988 case and it's reported in volume 164 of the Commonwealth Law Reports at page 387. Now look I've got to tell you that when you go to read this case uh, the judgments are all over the place because the judges could see what they wanted to do 
but uh, it took a few pieces of um, of uh, what you might call mental gymnastics for them to get there. The circumstances in Walton's and Ma were pretty simple. Walton's was purchasing land, purchasing land because they wanted to make a new department store, and so the seller agreed to sell them the land and started doing the preparations to make sure that the land was going to meet Walton's specifications. So they started knocking down existing buildings and uh, and getting everything organised um, so that the land would be ready. And the reason they started doing this before the contract was signed and sealed is because Walton's had said to them, it is important to us that there be no delays. We cannot brook any delays with this. If there's even the threat of delays, that needs to be sorted out. And so Ma started, uh, started work um, as a result of that representation from Walton's. Walton's was saying, look, we're going to buy this land from you. Just get on with it. You can tell what's going to happen next. The Walton's company underwent a restructure and they decided not to proceed with the expansion. They contacted Ma and said, yeah, actually, we're not going to buy it anymore. Two months after the decision was made, they informed the other party. By this time, Ma had sunk a lot of cost into this project. They had sunk a lot of a lot of coin, and so they said, "Well, okay, you can back away from the sale, but we're going to have to uh, recoup some of these losses." Walton's, of course, said, "No, you can't recoup any of your losses. And the reason you can't recoup your losses is because." There's no contract. We're not obliged to buy this land off you. And Ma said, but hang on, you said there was going to be a contract. You said that you were in a hurry. And you said that you wanted us to start um, knocking buildings down and preparing the land on the strength of that representation. We're going to hold you to this representation. Now this dispute ended up before the High Court. How do you reckon the High Court resolved it? Well, the High Court went back to just those cases that we've been talking about in this lecture, and they ended up with five rules that they look at. The first rule for promissory estoppel is there must be a representation. Now, a representation doesn't have to be a verbal statement. It can be sort of a clever leading of somebody into an understanding, but one way or another, there must be a representation. They must be putting it to the other party that a certain set of circumstances exists or will exist. Second thing is, the representer, the person making the representation, must induce reliance on the representation. Now let's think about this in terms of Walton's and Ma. Our representation is, we're going to buy the land, so please start knocking buildings down. Inducing reliance. They've said, look, please go ahead and do this. We want you to rely on our representation that we're going to rely on the, that we're going to buy the land. The third element is that the representee must actually rely upon the representation. So if somebody has told you as a pre contractual statement, look, go ahead and do things because we're going to go through with this contract and you rely upon that then you've met that third element for estoppel. The fourth is that the representor must know that the representee is relying upon it. So I've made a representation to you. I've induced your reliance on the representation. You have actually relied upon the representation and I know that you've relied upon it. And the final element is that the person relying on the representation must suffer a harm if the representation is departed from. So again, let's run this through Walton's and Ma. What was the representation? The representation was go out and start knocking buildings down because we're going to um, enter into this contract. Was reliance induced? Yes, absolutely. They've said, Walton's have said, go and do things on the strength of this representation. Ma, the representee, has actually gone and done things on the basis of that representation. And Walton's knew it. They knew that they were doing it. 
Would they suffer a detriment if the representation was relied, uh, resolved from, if it was moved away from, departed from? Yes, absolutely they would, because they would not be able to recoup the costs that they had spent knocking these buildings down. As a result, the High Court said to Waltons, you owe Mara a whole bunch of money. Those five elements show you how promissory estoppel works in Australia. Let's have another look at another example. This is a hypothetical one um, that you will find in the lecture notes where a developer is given a long-term lease over part of a shopping centre to a cinema operator for a certain amount of rent per week, $5,000. The economy is taking a turn for the worse. Cinema attendance is down, $5,000 is not going to be met. The operator speaks to them. Now the shopping centre, of course, could just kick them out, but that would mean that they would be getting nothing. The result was that the shopping centre said, we'll accept a lower payment until we decide otherwise. After the economy recovers, they go back to the $5,000. This is sounding very much like High Tree's house, yeah? They go back to the $5,000 and then the shopping centre says, guess what, we want you to make up all of the unpaid rent from the period of time where you weren't paying so much rent. So, we've got a situation that sounds very much like High Tree's house. Let's run it through those elements of estoppel from Walton's. Is there a representation? The representation is, yes, while the economy is in such a downturn, you can pay us less rent. Who made the representation? The shopping centre. Did they induce reliance on the representation? Well, yes, absolutely they did. They said, you are safe to act on this representation. From now, you can start paying us less rent. Did the representee actually rely? Yes, they did, because they started paying less rent. Did the representor know that they were relying upon it? Yes, because they knew that they were collecting less rent. If they now resile from or depart from their promise, is the promisee going to suffer? Well, absolutely, because they're going to have to come up with thousands upon thousands of dollars to make up for the, the rent payments that they didn't make during the period where they were paying lesser rent. Under those circumstances, it would be very feasible to argue promissory estoppel.